All right, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning at Ligon Street Christian Chapel. Uh, for those that are here with us this morning, I'm sure you'll agree with me that it is quite a chilly morning. So how about we warm up our hearts and our voices by singing praises to our God. Uh, shall we stand and sing our first song, um, King of Kings? Yeah, please stand. <laughs> In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To the cradle in the dirt the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father and the church And the church was Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Of 
In today's passage from 2 Corinthians, Paul issues a challenge to the Corinthians. What is their response to grace? How do their lives change in response to knowing that God, who sent Jesus to die on the cross, became poor for their sake so that they may become rich? That same challenge applies to us today. Do we live and conduct ourselves differently in response to what Jesus has done? Our next two songs speak of this grace that was given to us, and because of this grace, um, we ought to live lives for him. Let's continue singing our next two songs, Amazing Grace and Glories of Calvary. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Promise good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion me as long as life and yours. My chains are gone, I've been set. Songs proclaiming the glories of. 
Calvary With every breath, Lord, how I long To sing of Jesus who died for me Lord, take me deeper into the glories of Calvary. Sinners find eternal joy in the triumph of your wounds. By our Savior's crimson flow, holy rock. Has been removed, and your saints below join with your saints above, rejoicing in the risen land. My heart is filled with a thousand songs, proclaiming the glories of Calvary. With every breath, Lord, how I long. Sing of Jesus who died for me. My heart is filled with a thousand songs, proclaiming the glories of Calvary. With every breath, Lord, how I long to sing of Jesus who died for me. Lord, take me deeper into the glory. Please be seated, and I'll pass the time now over to Melvin. Well, good morning to all of you. It's uh, really nice uh, to see uh, you all again. Um, yeah, a big welcome to those who are here, of course, and uh, those who are joining us uh, uh, through the uh, live stream, a big welcome to you. And uh, for those who are not able to make it, and uh, we know that many of you are down with the flu, and also uh, with those who have just been uh, tested positive for COVID, uh, our prayer goes with you, and thank you for joining us this morning. And being the long weekend, and, and we know that many of you are also traveling and are watching uh, from, um, and you're joining us through the live feed, and uh, we are thankful that you are able uh, to still do that this morning with us. So a big welcome to all of you, and uh, could I uh, just invite all of you now to perhaps get up from your seats, and uh, well, it's a cold morning. I'm sure we can benefit with the warm fellowship, uh, we can benefit, I mean, you're up for it, the warm handshake or the, I don't know, yeah, the, the notch or the, the fist bump, well, let us welcome one another. Can we all try that? Let us say hi to the people around you and uh, try our best to make, make sure that they are welcome. Welcome back. Um, I know that there have been uh, quite a few uh, visitors in our midst uh, the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure there are any this morning. Uh, just to get a show of hands, uh, anyone uh, amongst us that this is your first time with us? Uh, anyone? Just a quick show of hands. Nope? Okay, you've all been here before. Well, a big welcome to all of you. 
And uh, it's really good to see uh, some of our visitors are back uh, with us, and it's our prayer uh, that all of us uh, will benefit from, uh, will be blessed uh, from this morning's uh, service as we continue to think through um, the letter to second, uh, the, le- the book from uh, 2 Corinthians, and uh, as we also spend our next moment uh, worshipping our Lord Jesus together uh, by singing songs to Him, hearing His word read, taught, um, pray to Him, and uh, we pray that we'll be blessed by that. Okay, a couple of announcements now. If I could get you to, yeah, turn your thoughts to the, um, some of the announcements, and you can find them in the uh, church electronic bulletin. Home viewers, you know where to look for the QR code, somewhere on your screen, and uh, for those who are here, it's just behind me on the wall. Okay, and uh, let's start off with the uh, first announcement. And uh, you can see that it's uh, to do with the uh, women's ministry. And without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand the time over to Rachel, and uh, who'll be telling us a bit more uh, about that. Wonder who's been shocked recently by the prices: um, petrol, gas, uh, eight dollars for a head of lettuce, um, four twenty for a sushi hand roll. Those used to be two dollars. Um, I wonder if you also have this thought every now and then that how are other people affording these price hikes? Um, Especially those uh, struggling to make ends meet, uh, might be out of a job uh, and have to make a choice not on whether to skip out on lettuce um, but to skip um, a a meal during the day. Um, So... Good news, Um, there's a small but significant way that we can all help. Um, Over the next couple of months, we'll be collecting food donations and toiletries donations um, here at Ligon, and we'll be passing it on to New Hope Baptist Church, um, who have a ministry called Community Care. Great thing about this is um, the food will go to meeting um, people's physical needs, um, but the church as well. Uh, is a Christ-centered church, um, and they'll also be looking to um, provide for people's spiritual needs um, by introducing them to Christ. So how can you help? Um, there's boxes out the front um, at the welcome team desk, um, so you can drop off any non-perishable food um, and, and common need toiletries there. Uh, there's some ideas in the friend, um, but if you're not too sure, you can just reach out to myself or Auntie Kit um, just to check whether it's all okay. Um, so thanks a lot for those that have already supported and um, next time that you see a, a shocking price, um, hopefully that can prompt you into, into action too. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rachel, for that. And uh, just continuing on with uh, the other announcements, and uh, you see as you scroll uh, further down, you see there's a little flyer. Uh, And of course, we're going to send a similar flyer to all of you on WhatsApp, and so that it's uh, very convenient for you to forward it to friends that you could invite. And that's regarding the upcoming Sunday school anniversary. Uh, The speaker is uh, Steve Stoke from the uh, OAC Ministries, a great event to be part of. And uh, not just for our children to celebrate, and not just for the church to be mindful that children's ministry is vital, uh, but also an opportunity for us to think of friends who have children, and what a way to uh, help them, to introduce them to the church, and prayerfully when they meet uh, God's people, they meet friends, uh, they meet Jesus. Yeah? So another event that we could use in reaching out to friends who do not know Jesus. So think of those people. Um, yeah, moving on uh, to some other announcements, and just a note about uh, church offering. Uh, the board met uh, in our regular uh, monthly uh, meeting, and, um, and, and it was felt that it will benefit the church greatly. Once again, as we gradually work towards returning uh, to some of the things that, um, that is very much part of our weekly service, and one of them would be offering. Uh, we thought it will benefit the church as next week we, we're going to do, we're going to reintroduce the passing of the offering bags. A um, couple of reasons. One is that uh, there are already quite a few who have been uh, asking us 
uh, yeah, we're gonna, when are we going to do that? And, and as they feel more comfortable with that uh, mode of giving, so we're going to use that, but much more importantly, uh, we felt that it is actually quite a good, a very helpful visual reminder as part of the worship unto God. So there will be offering bags being passed next Sunday during the service, uh, kind of after the announcements, uh, before the prayer. Uh, so come prepared if that is your uh, preference way of, of giving uh, in worship to God. Uh, but at the same time, while the offering bags are being passed, uh, we will also be beaming the uh, church uh, online account uh, onto the screen. And uh, so those who prefer uh, to do it online, perhaps, you could also utilize uh, that time uh, to uh, give your offering uh, to God. So that's that regarding uh, offering and something to look forward to next week. And, uh, and just a note and update about the church lunch ministry and praise God and, and for many of you who have responded and now, now we have a growing list of number of cooks and of course we continue to welcome uh, more helpers uh, but you note that under the um, announcement regarding our church lunch ministry, we are still looking for helpers. We are looking for helpers. And the job description as to what is involved uh, with the cleaning, the serving of food, it's, it's briefly outlined there. And I think it's pretty um, yeah, understandable, uh, comprehensive. So we, we need manpower, we need more volunteers. All right, and if you are able to serve in that area, uh, which I think is pretty doable for most of us, um, yeah, do put up your hand. We would really appreciate that. And uh, let Wan Ling know, and uh, her contact is there, and uh, she'll be most delighted to hear from you. Okay. Um, now, the rest of the uh, other announcements, I'll, I'll leave it to you to read um, in your own time. Okay, they've been there, um, they've been there for a while. Uh, but they are still relevant announcements. So I'll let you to follow up on your, in your own. Now we're going to come to a time of prayer, and uh, we're going to pray for a few things, and, uh, and I'd like to invite you to join me in that. Let us pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we come before you, thanking you for your uh, goodness upon us. Father, as we just briefly mentioned about reintroducing the offering bags uh, as, as some sort of a visual reminder um, of an, one of the very important ways as a mark of our discipleship, as our love, as our response to your love for us that we give. But yet, Lord, as we think about giving, Lord, it is you who inspires us to give. Because as we look at the cross, it is you who have shown what giving, true loving giving looks like. Lord, you gave your son. And Lord, Ephesians 1 reminds us, because we are in Christ, we have every single spiritual blessing. In other words, nothing lacking. And Father, we want to praise you and thank you for, for treating us with such loving kindness. We pray and ask, Lord, that as a church, please help us to not to lose sight of that grace that you have so kindly lavished upon our lives. And we pray as an outflow of that life that is gripped by your love, Lord, that we would also be a people who give lovingly, selflessly, as worship to you. Father in heaven, this morning we come before you also thinking of the many needs in, this, uh, in, in the life of this church here, your church. Father, we think of those who are down with flu and those who, are, who have been tested positive for COVID um, just recently in the last week. We, we continue to pray for their recovery. Please watch over them. Father, we want to pray that, uh, Lord, for those who have recovered, we thank you for answering our prayers. It's a great joy to see them here with us. Father, this morning, as we pray for those who are not well, we also think of those who are, shall I say, Lord, um, who is in, not in the best position. We've been praying for our brother Joel in Singapore. 
Father, even though we do not fully understand uh, his situation, uh, the exact condition, but Lord, we, 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 we are thankful to you because you are sovereign. Father, we thank you that in what was feared at first that there, there might be bacteria found in the surgery wounds. Um, Lord, we thank you that, that it was all clear and that you was able to proceed with the surgery last Thursday. Father, I want to praise you and thank you that the surgeons in Singapore have, have gave the, um, the seal of approval uh, in that uh, the, the surgery has been successful. But Father, we, we know time will tell as to the exact, um, how he's doing in terms of recovery. And Father, we know that you are the great healer. And we pray and we ask that, Lord, that you do that. That is impossible with us. We pray that, Lord, for his healing. We pray that, uh, Lord, that uh, please watch over him. And above all, we ask in this time that uh, as obviously and quite possibly Joe must be asking a lot of questions. We pray in the midst of all that, Lord, that he would experience your comfort. He would experience your presence that is always with him. And we ask, Lord, that through this very difficult and challenging situation, Lord, that you find joy in you and that his faith in you would deepen and increase. Father, this morning we also remember the students that you have put under our, our care. Well, it's the time of the year, Lord, um, where they have assignments, deadlines to meet, um, they have exams to prepare for, they have projects coming left, right and centre, uh, mostly deadlines. Uh, Father, we pray for them. We ask that please provide them with, with good health, help them to manage their, their time, their health uh, well, uh, so that they, their, their preparations, so that they could enjoy an uninterrupted preparations. Father, we also want to pray that they would see times like this as an opportunity, how they could use their study, how they could use their time as worship to you. That despite the busyness, Lord, that they may learn to cultivate healthy habits, uh, things like spending time with you, meeting with God's people, um, reading your word, and, and learning to trust you, in, in, in all this, bus in, in all this uh, busyness. So, Father, we commit our students in this time that they would learn uh, to study for your glory. Father, this morning we also remember um, the children that you have entrusted into our care. We pray that the next moment as they head off to the back hall and as they enjoy the Sunday school, we pray that you use the Sunday school teachers for your glory that they'll point them to Jesus. But while teaching them about the Bible, we pray that there would also be living models of what Jesus looks like. And we pray that, Lord, you use them to minister to these children. And we thank you for each of them. And we pray all this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, children, um, time for your Sunday school. Back home. Through this hour, and if you'd like to follow your teachers uh, to do that, go for it. Thank you. Always oh, really good to see their eagerness, their enthusiasm. And uh, for those who are joining uh, from home, and uh, we hope you get better soon, and hope, we hope that in the weeks to come, uh, you are available to join us at church or here in this building and, uh, and to be part of the Sunday School. Okay, for those who are, of us here who are in the front chapel, uh, we come now to the Bible reading. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, we are continuing our studies from uh, 2 Corinthians. And uh, this morning, we've arrived at uh, chapter 8 and chapter 9. Very big passages. So, if you have a Bible, it will really be helpful if you could turn to that passage now. And while I invite uh, Alicia to come up and to read the passage for us. Thank you, Alicia. Good morning, church. Um, do you join with me in opening our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 
to chapter 9, verses 15. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. I thank God, who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and also his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honour the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we are sending with them our brother, who has often proved to us in many ways that is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner, and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honour to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you, so that the churches can see it. Chapter 9. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints, for I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you in Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident." So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or other compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, He has scattered abroad His gifts to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of this passing grace has, God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Alicia, for that. Oh, you a cup of drink. That is really a big passage. Well done. And uh, thank you for reading that uh, clearly for us. But one of the good things about working through the Bible systematically, uh, like what we often do, the, the technical term they use in a Bible college is, is uh, expository preaching. Oh, the, the great benefit to that is that eventually you will come to every topic. You can't run away from it. <laughs> and uh, the reason I tell you that is uh, because for many preachers that I know, for many pastors, Preaching on giving is really not the first topic that they will pick on to speak, to speak about. Well, as that's at least for the friends that I know who are pastors. Um, but today we've come to the passage about giving. Well, let's pray and let us ask God to help us understand His Word. Father God, we come before you acknowledging that we are unable to not just live out your word on our own effort, but even to understand your word. We pray that this morning that uh, you speak to our hearts. And we thank you for the reminder from Hebrews that your word is likened to the double-edged sword, that it will cut our hearts open, it will reveal our motives, it will speak to our mind. And we pray that in the ne next moment that you please do that. But we know that, Lord, when you minister to us Lord then you do so out of love and so that as we obey your word we would be shaped to be more like your son Jesus so we pray for that for that and we ask that Lord your spirit will help us and we ask all this for Jesus sake amen well keep your Bibles open and uh, the outline will be beam onto the wall behind me uh, for our home viewers, it will appear uh, somewhere on your screen. Well, three different types, uh, th three different items to represent three kinds of givers. You can see it behind me, very simple. First, you get, if the picture is too small, the first is the flint, looks a bit like a rock, and, and it's really to get the fire going. And, and you know, uh, to get anything out of the flint, you must hammer it. And even then, you might only get chips, little sparks. Next item is the sponge. Now, as you know, to get water out of sponge, the harder you squeeze, the more pressure you apply, the more you will get. That's the second kind of giver. But the third kind, honey, is very different. It just overflows generously with its own sweetness. So what kind of giver are you? The flint, the sponge, or the honey? A, a while ago, I, I heard of, 
of a church where the elders uh, gave their people a, a, a lecture, a serious lecture, about the level of giving in their church. Now, not because they were not giving enough, but because they were giving far too much. The people weren't well off. They knew the amount that the people had been giving in order to support the gospel work, the mission work, would stretch most of them. Very rare sin. It's not a sin you often, often see. Uh, mostly when, when pastors talk about giving, they do so with heavy heart because the offerings are declining. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians, chapter 8 to chapter 9, now Paul shows us another church, the Macedonian church, who was amazingly generous. That their giving was, you could say, like honey. Now, how do you know if a church is grieved by the grace of God? How do you know? Uh, what are the clues that when you look at a Christian, they are grieved by the gospel? Well, you could say from the Bible, you know, uh, they are humble, for instance, self-effacing, faithful, they, they seek to preach Christ. Very true. Uh, or their character is being transformed uh, to become more like Christ. They, they serve, they meet regularly with God's people, they pray, they talk to God, they, they rely on God, and so on and so forth. But what we often don't hear, uh, there is another mark which shows that a church is gripped by God's grace. And that is its generosity. Now, when chapter 8 to chapter 9 was read by Elisha a moment ago, notice something very striking. The passage we know is about giving of money. And yet money was not mentioned even once. Uh, but the grace of God was mentioned at least 10 times. You see, Christian giving, giving that is like honey, is all about grace, inspired by grace. Please look at the, the heart of, of the verse in these two chapters. And I think that key verse is chapter 8, verse 9. Look at it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. You see, Christian giving is inspired by Christ's grace, God's goodness to us. Generosity reflects a gospel-shaped heart, a gospel-reformed mind. Now briefly, the background. Paul in Romans chapter 15 verse 25 to verse 26, and I printed those verses in your outline, but you could read it in your own time, right? And, and it mentioned how the churches in Macedonia and Achaia were, were pleased to make contribution for the church in Jerusalem. Why? Well, because they were facing severe famine and persecution. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 to 3, and if you look that up in your time, in your own time, now Paul had already appealed to the Corinthians to give, and they were very eager. They agreed. It wasn't just an opportunity to help the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem to put food on the table, not just so that they had mattress to lie on at night, but it also showed gospel unity. Because you see, the Jewish brothers back then, they, they, they are always questioning the gentle brothers and sisters, are they the real deal? And this is an opportunity. An opportunity for fellowship. An opportunity to show gospel unity between the Gentile and Jewish believers, that they are one in Jesus Christ. But the Corinthian church was in danger of not carrying through with their pledge. So Paul urged the Corinthian church to finish what they had started. And in the process of doing that, now Paul gave some very, very helpful teaching about giving. He gave two reasons why giving is very important to the Corinthian church and to all of us who are listening this morning. First, I call it, from chapter 8, 
giving defined. Uh, in my previous visits to Malaysia, and I'm sure you have shared similar experience, uh, you know, one of those currency exchange booths, uh, and every time when I'm at one of these currency exchange booths, and you get the person at the counter, right? They, they, they love to do this, they just tap their finger, they wet their fingers with the saliva, and they'll start counting the money. Right, they, they'll put my Australian dollars under either a special machine, or they held it up against the bright light. They'll stretch it out, they'll look against the sunlight, or something like that. Why do they do that? Well, to look for the watermark, to prove it's genuine. Our lives, our giving that honours God, should bear the watermark, the stamp of grace. The, the Corinthians, you see, were a wealthy, prosperous church compared to the Macedonian church, which was poor, living in difficult circumstances. Paul, at the start of chapter 8, held up the Macedonian church against the light, even though materially poor. But they bore the stamp, the watermark, of grace. They passed the test. They were distinctively Christians. Please look at verse 1 or verse 2. Paul wastes no time and he says, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty well up in generosity. Verse 3, see that? They even gave beyond their ability. So we know their giving is selfless, it is sacrificial. And, and more than that, it was also remarkably enthusiastic. Verse 4, see that? Sometimes Paul had to beg others to give, but they beg Paul to allow them to give. And it was also about living for Jesus, worship. It's not about money. Verse 5, they saw it, look at it, verse 5, they saw it as a matter of giving their lives first to the Lord. Worship. See, as they gave themselves to God wholeheartedly, they gave themselves to one another. And of course, when you do that, it affects how you think about your resources. And as a result, they gave their money to help. Uh, why was Paul telling this? Uh, why was Paul telling the Corinthians this? Oh, verse 6, look at it. So that when Titus goes to visit, they will be prepared to carry out their pledge of supporting the Jerusalem church. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, especially at the start of 1 Corinthians, you, you see one of the major problems or one of the, the characteristics of the Corinthian Christians. You, you find that the, the Corinthians were filled with envy. They, they were very competitive by nature. They loved to compare. And, 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 but isn't it quite interesting that, that Paul here compared them with the Macedonian church? And, and it's not like comparing like with like. I mean, it's not comparing with apple with apple. It's not comparing them, say, with Hillsong or city on a hill, or these mega wealthy churches. This is more like comparing them with a tiny poor church in Sudan, or maybe a church who don't even have a building to, to, to together in Myanmar. The Corinthians were rich, comfortable, resourceful. But the Macedonians were facing poverty, struggling, going through trials. Realistically, they, they were poles apart. Well, look at verse 7. Why the comparisons? You see, the Corinthians love to compare themselves with others and to talk themselves up. So, with a bit of tongue in cheek, verse 7, look at it, Paul says, well, just as you excel in everything, you claim you're so spiritual, you, you are so good, right? What about when it comes to giving? And verse 8, you see, what's the punchline? Verse 8 the challenge. He's saying, now you have the, the, the perfect opportunity to prove you are super spiritual as you claim to be. 
to show you are gripped by the gospel. So give like the Macedonians. Uh, we too can excel in many things, perhaps in the handling of the Bible, in attending good Bible teaching conventions, in being friendly, uh, and so on and so forth. But, but what about the grace of giving? Do we pray that our giving is enabled by God's grace? Not just pray that God will provide for our needs, will provide for us, so that by our giving to us, we can be generous, so that we might excel like the dirt poor Macedonians. Notice further, how could the Macedonians give like that? How could they? Well, because they understood that giving is a response to the grace of God, shown through Jesus. Uh, back in verse 2, remember? Take, take a look at verse 2 again. We, we are told that there was overflowing joy. It wasn't grudging giving, overflowing joy, but not in the severe trial or poverty, but joy in Christ. Why were they so gripped by Christ? Please take a look at verse 9 again. Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that, through he, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. I think it was in 2011, I could be wrong, just from memory. There was a royal wedding. In fact, around this time, it was spring in UK. Prince Philip, second, line, uh, second in the line to the throne, found an intelligent, beautiful bride, Kate Middleton, at his university. But, but imagine if he had gone through, gone about finding his bride rather differently. Imagine he went down to the poorest slum on earth, walked into a brothel, found a prostitute, not because she wants to, but because she needed to, because she needs the money. And imagine William got down on his knees, proposed. And imagine they officially got married, so that means they got to have this uh, royal wedding in, in the Westminster uh, uh, Chapel. And now she's part of the royal family. And she will inherit all that Prince William inherits and will be treated as royalty. Can you imagine that? That would be unthinkable, wouldn't it? Of course, the queen wouldn't approve that. Nobody would approve that. No royal family on this earth would approve that. That would never happen. Except that it actually has. It actually has. It has happened to every single Christian. In one verse, verse 9 here, Paul sums up the entire Christian message. How God treats us with undeserving grace. He explains it in financial terms. See, Jesus has all the splendor of heaven, the Son of God. He shares in all the glory of heaven, yet became poor when he became a man. On the cross, he gave, gave up the most precious thing of all, his unbroken fellowship with the Father, as he took on the burden of our sin took on God's wrath that sin provoked, and he sunk to the depths of hell. Why? Verse 9. So that through his poverty, we might become rich. We who were spiritually bankrupt have been made sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ. That means through the grace of Christ, we are made royalty. We are immeasurably rich. He has lifted us from the lowest of lowest to the heights of heaven, lifted us from the gutters into glory. And therefore, in the words of chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, and if you know, if you know this grace, this supreme act of generous, show it. Show it in your giving. Give. See, all we do flow out of what God has done for us. We see His love towards us, so we with his help, love others. We experience his patience with us. 
So with his help, we are patient with others. And likewise, we see his generosity in giving to us, and so we, generous, we are generous in giving to others. In verse 10 of verse 12, now Paul advised the Corinthians how they could proceed with that. He reminded them of their, their pledge a year earlier and encouraged them to follow through when Titus visits them. But Paul qualified in verse 13 and verse 14 that, that God is not looking for them to give beyond their means. It's not asking them to give beyond what they don't have. God knows what we have. So be sensible. Or as Paul says here, you don't have to give while you are hard-pressed. He's not asking for that. But, but to see the point there he, that he, is that he wants them to be generous, to see the needs of others and to share with, with a brother or sister in trouble. And so that they might be relieved and no one is left in need. Verse 15 to verse 24, this big portion, this big chunk, big section of passage, is a detailed explanation of Paul's co-workers being, being sent around so that the Corinthians' giving gets collected. Now, what is the 21st century equivalent of a visit from Titus? No, 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 it's not a visit from me, not a visit from one of our elders. You see, the equivalent, I think, is really what, are really some of the ways to give to make sure our, our planned giving happens regularly. Some examples include the offering bags that we mentioned in the announcements that will be passed around next week. Or we can set up direct debit. The church account details are in the church bulletin, the friend. Or, or you get appeal for special needs made by the board or, or by people from the Women's Fellowship that we heard again in the announcements, or the Ukraine uh, refugees uh, relief effort as we partner with a church in, in Poland. So, uh, things like that. But, but do you see what 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is driving at here? You see, at the heart of Christian giving is a response to the love and grace God has given us through Jesus. So please highlight verse 9. You see, many non-Christians are very, very generous. We see that in the Good Friday appeal, many non-Christians are very giving. But, but they don't give because of verse 9. And perhaps even for Christians, many times we forget we give because of verse 9. But what sets us apart, what sets Christian giving apart is because of God's grace and love. And that's why Paul calls it in verse 7, the grace of giving, not the practice or the discipline or even the rightness of giving. It is grace. Grace given to you. Put in our care. So what we have don't even belong to us. So it's a hint that we are only managers. We are to use it for His glory. It's a gift of being able to give in the light of God's gracious gift to you. Uh, that's why it is not so right when, when people ask, and I get that quite, many, uh, quite a few times, you know, do I give 10%? That's what the Old Testament says. Do I give 10% before tax or after tax? I mean, that's fine. As a guide, I, if you give it in honour, in worship to God, 10%, if you want to do that, that's fine. But we should ask, do I know, chapter 8, verse 1, the grace God has given me in Jesus? You see, a 10% tie or whatever figure you put there uh, may be a good guide in the Old Testament. But really, it can work like a gate, doesn't it? Your gate can keep things in securely. But it can also prevent love from flowing out when a need arises. Let me give you an example. Remember Luke chapter 10 the parable of the Samaritan who went out of his way to help the enemy, the Jew, who was left on the road to die. You see, he could have said, I've already sent him to the hospital. What more do you want? Didn't you hear what Rachel said in the announcement this morning? Nothing is cheap. 
petrol especially. Have you seen last night? I pumped $2.15. Ridiculous. I've already sent him to the hospital. What more do you want? I've already met my 10% quota. Uh, but he didn't. The Samaritan gave selflessly like the Macedonians here. And Jesus says that's what love is. Love is like an open gate, an open palm. It gives selflessly. Once I remember at another church, they got the congregation to stand up facing the CBD area, the CBD side of the church, and pray that God will bring in some of those businessmen, working people in. Why? Because they have the money. They are the main income contributor, the white-collar workers. Look at the Macedonians. Look at the Macedonians. Or, or the poor lady who gave only two coins that Jesus complimented in Mark chapter 12. That's what many church boards, fundraisers miss. Too often they, they strategize. They say, let's go for the big wallets. But what we should look for is people with big hearts. See, when we give, the place to look at is not at our accounts or what others may be giving. You know, ah, oh, I don't have enough. That, that guy, look at how many houses he owns. He should be the one who carried the weight. No, 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 don't look at that. But look at the cross. That's what Paul tells us. Pray that God will give us a friend a fresh pair of eyes to see what Christ has done for us. And that's where the grace of giving begins. The cross. Well, let's move on to chapter 9. And I call this section, Grace, a giving described. Now, in chapter 9, verse 1 to verse 4, we find, again, Paul reminding the Corinthians of their pledge to give. They, might be, they must be very reluctant to give. Uh, Paul is reminding them again to finish off what they started. And I'm sure we, we can identify a bit with that. I mean, remember that, that violin lying in your room or the piano left untouched for a while. You had grand plans to learn, but gradually gave up learning. Or some house maintenance work, like me. You pack it aside and then forgot about it. We know how hard it is to match that initial enthusiasm with continuing effort. Now, we are not sure why Paul had to keep reminding the Corinthians. Maybe, maybe they, they had good intentions but simply forgotten. Maybe they had a change of heart. Or perhaps the ones whom Paul called the super apostles in 1 Corinthians had been planting seeds of disunity causing division, you know, that have erode confidence in Paul. So, so they diverted or withheld their giving. Or maybe their daily busyness got in the way. We, we don't know. But what we do know is Paul giving them advance notice that his partners are arriving for the collection. Hence verse 4, so that they will not be caught unprepared. Or so that verse 5, uh, they are ready. In other words, planned, committed, so that they don't give grudgingly. End of verse 5, you see that. And that happens, doesn't it? Especially if we just rock up and sometimes the offering bags come. Oops, we, we felt guilty. People are watching maybe. So we just dig whatever we have in our pockets and, and throw it in. We, we give grudgingly. <laughs> It reminds me of an old story in, in, in a church service during the offering segment. The usher with, with the offering bag came around, and this guy was caught by surprise. And he quickly pulled something from his wallet and, and dumped it into the bag. And then blood drained out of his face when he realized it was a $50 note. And he wanted to dip into the bag and to take back the money. The usher stood back and said, no, 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 no. Only put in. No taking out. This is not an ATM machine. And the man begged, please. Usher asked, why? The man whispered, 
I put in 50 bucks, but I meant to put in five dollars. The usher whispered back, don't worry, God knows you only intended to put in five dollars, and he moved on. <laughs> That's what God doesn't want. Paul says, verse 5, not grudgingly, or verse 7, plan, give what you have decided, not reluctantly or under compulsion. You see, he wants his readers to give not because they are guilted into it, pressured into producing their, their debit credit card. Because look at the end of verse 7. Please look at it. That's another verse to underline. For God loves a cheerful giver. Lots of giving can be prompted by guilt, duty, self-interest, what I can get in return. It can motivate people to be very, very generous. But you see, only grace will make you and I a cheerful giver. Once again, you see a hint from Paul to look at the cross. And that's where cheerful giving actually begins. Amy Carmichael, the missionary who set up orphanages in India, said this, One can give without loving, but one cannot love without giving. Next motivation, verse 6 to verse 11. Paul tells us to remember that, that when we sit down and, and as we plan for our giving next week or in a month to come, he said, don't think of it as giving. It is actually sowing. Look at verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You see, when we, we give, we are tempted to think we, we give away. It's like bucket with water, pour out, not coming back. We lose. Uh, Paul says, no, 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 no. Uh, not when we give to honour God. Verse 6 tells us when we sow, we will also reap. There are blessings, returns. But he's not saying the more checks we sign or, or the more often we tap our debit card, God will pay us back more. He's not saying that. Something you, you will become, something you give more to become rich. If I give more, I will make more money. But Paul says, think agriculture. When you sow a seed, you reap fruit, not seeds. You reap a harvest of fruit so that people could eat from it, so that people could be refreshed by it, so that people, others can benefit from it. So this is not about greed and giving out of self-interest. It was told that at a renowned prosperity-type gospel evangelist, you know, the prosperity gospel, what it is, right? Like basically, they say, if you put faith in them, have more faith, uh, God can heal you. If you... If you Give money to them, and, and, and God will bless you with even more prosperity gospel. So if we have this prosperity type gospel evangelist who was on a radio appealing to the listeners that if you send in to him $20, God will give you three times in return. And a caller called in, suggested to him, why don't you give us each the $20 instead so you get back three times what you need? <laughs> Look carefully at these verses. There is no promise of you give, you get. But the more you give, the more God blesses your giving, provides for you so that you can give more and be more generous on every occasion. See that in verse 8? God blesses us so that we abound in every good work. If we still don't get it, look at verse 9 to 10. As we receive God's gift and share with those in need, verse 10, God increases our store of seed and our harvest of righteousness. Why? Look at verse 11. You will be made rich in everywhere so that you can be generous 
on every occasion. So Paul is not saying we get rich by giving. But when we give, we show ourselves to be good stewards, good managers of what he has put in our care. And then he entrusts us with more. And grace abounds so that we can keep on being generous. Maybe the reaping is financial, I don't know. But it is not limited by that. See, sometimes we think giving will impoverish us. But Paul says Christian giving enriches us and others. Grace abounds. Now, one more thing that we, we reap and we, when we sow, we reap a deeper fellowship with others. A while back at, at a back hall during a, a lunch function at a building here, I will leave them unnamed. <laughs> uh, two very young girls were in a standoff over one piece of cake. Who's going to get it? The dad asked his daughter, share? And she said, no, 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 since there is only one piece. Dad quickly took the plate to another table and cut the one piece into three pieces, brought it back, and he said, wow, so many. Can you give one to your friend? The daughter looked at it. Very impressed with the dad, she nodded, gave two, because she only needed one. She was very sincere. She meant what she said. She only needed one. And the next thing you see, all, all the frostiness melted. The two girls became buddies, shared from the same plate. That was pre-pandemic. And, and we all praised the dad. How ingenious. Quick thinking. Well done. Why is that? Uh, things like that don't just happen with a two- to three-year-old at the church back hall. But everywhere, when we give generously to God to bless others. Verse 12, when you scatter, Paul says, it not only meet the needs of God's people elsewhere, but results in overflowing thanks to our Heavenly Father. Verse 13 to verse 14, other Christians in the church in Jerusalem were thanking God for what the Corinthian church was doing, and not just that, they will also pray for them. Fellowship, closeness. Or as, or, or, or as verse 14 says, and in their prayer for you, their hearts will go out to you. One thing we will reap is stronger fellowship, deeper bond. See, when the Bible talks about scattering your gifts, it brings people together. It gathers. It draws people close. When we hoard, when we just spend it on ourselves, it divides. It keeps our society, as what we see in Melbourne as it is, very individualistic. But when the church scatters souls, it gathers. There's one, one example, what I'm doing now, scattering the seed of God's Word. Or it could be our Bible study leaders or our mission partners. Scattering the seed unites people. Remember chapter 8, verse 9. Jesus was broken on the cross for our sake. He was scattered, broken, speared, nailed, crushed, why? To gather us. The cross is the ultimate example of sharing. Scattered in order to gather us. See, in verse 15, we end, uh, the, the, the end of passage, where, where we begin. We end with the passage, how it began. Giving comes from grace. We give to God, to others, and the gospel work but we always end by giving thanks to him for his indescribable gift of grace to us. So what type of giver are you? The flint, the sponge, or the honey? A friend once said, 
when you find it an effort, when you struggle to give money away, find out what you readily spend money on. He pointed out that many of us are actually, in reality, we are not stingy people. And this passage is not attacking of stinginess. It's not. Just that many times we are generous towards different things. The more I thought about what my friend said, it's actually pretty close to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Remember those words? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That's where you are, that's what you are generous to. Let me give you an uh, embarrassing, uh, let me give you uh, an embarrassing uh, example. If I find an effort to give my money away, I can tell you it is not an effort to spend on books. You can check my receipts in my, my drawer, my bank accounts, it tells you that. Am I a book collector? No. <laughs> but I tell you why. You see, I know all that what the Bible teaches me, that my identity is in God. I am secured by the very fact that God loves me, that through grace made me His child, adopted me. That's where my security is, or should be. Uh, but as a pastor or, or a teacher, it is a temptation to find significance in what people at times may say. I get so much from that sermon, or from that seminar. I, I didn't think of that. That was helpful. That's good. See, I may get significance from what I know. For some, perhaps they love to spend on clothes because the approval of looking good, it's like me knowing things. For others, it can perhaps be travel or living in, in a good neighborhood. You see, Jesus is right. <laughs> Jesus is very sharp. Where your treasure is, what captures your heart, it flows through effortlessly. If you want to know who is contesting with God as Lord in your heart, find out what you so easily spend money on. And to break that grip, let's look at the cross again. Reflect on chapter 8, verse 9. Every competing treasure in this world tells you. Perhaps you need two homes, a European luxury car, whatever it is. The worldly treasure will demand so much from you. Slog harder, work harder, slave. Oh, get yourself into debt. But Jesus is the only treasure who has sacrificed for you. The only treasure who does that. He loves you. Let me finish with this. It was told that the late Christian author, Alan Redpath, was talking with a friend who said, Ah, our church costs too much. We are always asking for money. There's this, there's that. Money, money. Oh. And Alan Redpath said this. Some time ago, a boy was born at our home. He cost us a lot of money from the very beginning. He had a big appetite. He needed clothes, medicine, toys. Then he went to school. It cost a lot more. And later, he went to college and then university. And then he began dating. And that cost a fortune. <laughs> but then in his final year of uni, he died. And after his funeral, he hadn't cost us a penny. Uh, he asked his friend, which situation do you think you rather have? Long silence. And then Alan Redpath said this, as long as this church is alive, 
it will cost. But when it dies, that's when it stops costing you anything. Grace, generosity, gratitude to God, these are not optional extras of Christian living, but it's at the heart of discipleship. A dead church with little mission, little reaching out, won't cost you very much. But a church that is determined to make an impact in the world and the people around them for Christ will always cost because it is alive. Well, let's ask God to help us to be cheerful givers. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we come before you recognizing how in many ways we have forgotten that what we have are entrusted by you out of grace. We pray and we ask, Lord, please help us to be good stewards, to be good managers for what you have put under our care. Help us to, be, to see the cross with fresh pair of eyes. But what you have given to us through Jesus, and we ask, Lord, may that shape our hearts, reform our minds, and we ask, Lord, may that be reflected in our generosity. We pray all this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I'll hand the time back to uh, Andrew, and he's going to lead us in a final song. Thanks, Melvin, for those helpful reminders. Um, all right, let's just close off today's service by singing our final song, God of Grace. God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. Oh, the miracle of mercy, Jesus reaches down to me. God of grace, I stand in wonder as my God restores my soul his own blood has paid my ransom awesome cause to make me whole God of grace who loved and knew me long before the world began sent my Savior down from
Well, thank you, Andrew, and uh, the mus uh, and the musicians. Uh, well, that ends our service for today, and thank you for being here again, and thank you for joining us. Uh, for those who are tuning in online, uh, well, let me close with our prayer, and I would love to see you all next Sunday. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we come before you and ask you that in a week ahead, please continue to enable us to be a loving, effective witness for Jesus' sake. Please help us to be the salt and light in the world where you have placed us. We pray all this for Jesus' sake. Amen.